Hi everyone, Tim from Race Biz. Uh, welcome to the second edition of Racehorse Junkies, run by uh, Race Biz, 100% real with with Race Biz. Now, once again, I've got Gary on with me and myself. We're both uh, passionate racehorse men, and we have a few contacts along the way which we want to bring on board, which Gary will talk to about what he has something in store for us. Um, what we do is we just talk about anything racing. We just, uh, from the tracks, from black bookers to what's happened on the weekends, we do this once a fortnight and it's just to um, give guys an insight and, and we both do it as professional punters. I do full-time tipping um, and that. So I'll turn it over to Gary and he can start off. Hi, Tim. And I'm actually... Uh... Like Tim said, uh, I do racing uh, myself. I do my own ratings. I bet to my own ratings, and that's what that's my full time job these days. Uh, and especially since I live in Victoria, which is a different state of play. If you're out of Victoria, you may not understand. But uh, for the last fourteen weeks, I haven't been more than five kilometres away from my uh, house. In fact, I probably haven't been more than three and a half. And there's nowhere to go. We're in a state of lockdown, um, and uh, you know they, they have raised the curfew very nicely by our Premier two weeks ago. But uh, one of the things, as I said to somebody the other day, the only thing you could actually go out to in Melbourne after nine o'clock at night would be to go to uh, 7-Eleven to buy a, uh, an ice cream or a chocolate bar because there's nothing open. And if you do go to a uh, takeaway shop to get a coffee, you actually legally have to go back to your car to sit internally so you can remove your mask. One thing we all have in Melbourne everywhere is these because in your car or whatever else, you are. it is illegal to walk out even to put your rubbish bins out across the road where we have to to get where the, where the council comes to pick ours up without these. And people have actually had the police come to them because they've gone across the road to put their rubbish bins out, as you normally would at 9 o'clock at night or 8.30 at night, and they haven't had their mask on. So <clears throat> it has been strange times and, uh, you know, thankfully, racing is, is certainly going. I did hear the other day from someone who was saying that probably the betting ring in Caulfield and that wouldn't be as vibrant as it was. No, there's no one there. And, in fact, if you look at the races and you're watching it on any of the TV shows, you'll find the only people there are media. Even owners are not allowed to go. So it has been very strange. And we live in a state where our Premier has said that uh, we have to be in an average, a rolling average of the last 14 days of uh, five I think we're currently at about 9.3. And finally, they're starting to work out we will never get to five. So we are locked into it and hopefully we will be released. So, you know, currently there's no shops, no takeaways. And again, as I said, we've, we've all lived off racing for those who love it, like I do and, and other people. And uh, the other thing is, of course, AFL, but that's coming to an end. So, but we'll get on with our, our show about racing. Jeez, you'd be bugging if you're a bad cook. <sighs> Yeah, well, <laughs> I tell you what, don't forget, with takeaway, there's been people charged because it's about $1,670 and it's 5000 now, I think, if you bre breach certain other laws. There's been people charged for going seven kilometres away to go to their local uh, Thai restaurant because the one next to them wasn't what they were looking for. In fact, if for, for us, if we wanted to go to the uh, like Thai we wanted, it's probably eight kilometres. So everyone's forced you have to only get takeaway within five kilometres or get it through a, um, you know, a Deliveroo or Uber Eats. So, yes, it's very restricted. And, uh, you know, I'm sure, sure that some places like the local fish and chip shop or whatever else are doing okay. But, again, it's everything is just – there's nowhere to go. There's nothing to do. So, so guys are allowed to still drive Ubers? Strangely, I think they – yes, I think they are. That sort of happens to be – yep, and McDonald's is, uh, is, is open. But um, – Again, oh, by the way, if you go through a drive through at McDonald's, you must have your mask on while you place your order and uh, wait when you pay. You're not allowed to go anywhere without your mask on, including in your car. And yep. the other day I was driving around with my wife to, uh, to actually, because you can, by the way, for 12 weeks was only one person in a car. Now, if you're living in the same household, two of you can go in the same car within five kilometres to go to the to the uh, your local uh, supermarket. But it's strange. Sometimes you're driving in a car and you look to the car next to you and people still have their mask on. People have become so normal wearing a mask, right? Oh, and face shields, because for a while there, people got into the idea of, I know, we'll go and 
obviously bring in face shields and sell them because it is going to get hot and, you know, depending on the weather we are getting into summer, he's now outlawed face shields as well. Oh, it wow. must be a mask. So if a face shield or a bandana or some people were using scarves, all illegal, it has to be these, right? And the scary thing is if you do go to a local shopping centre, I'm not that far from uh, Westfield here, you go there, the car parks are very much contained. There's only probably 40% or 30% open um, because everything's closed. There's no cinemas, nothing. And there's only the two shopping centres because even the food courts and that can't open anymore. They could, but it's obviously not worth their while. No. So it's, it's pretty sad. I mean, you know, you go there and there's just nothing there. So... Um, so we get, we're getting it pretty good in the rest of the country, that's for sure. Well, the sad, I talk to people in New South Wales or Queensland and they're telling me about a few restrictions. Believe me, you needed to come to Melbourne to understand what restrictions are. And, you know, I think if anyone has done anything and they were put under house arrest, I think the best thing they should have done is done it the last four months because since March here, we've only had three weeks where we actually have been able to do unrestricted. By the way, stage... What we were doing pre-June when the rest of Australia was in lockdown is nothing like what it's been for the last 14 weeks here because we're in stage four. But that's in, inside Melbourne, the 5.2 million people living inside Melbourne, right, the, the, the steel wall, as uh, our Premier, Mr Andrews, calls it. Regional Victoria in the last two weeks is now pretty free. But you can't, it's a $5,000 fine if I was to go to regional Victoria. And now any shop or that in regional Victoria has to ask for ID of anyone who walks in in case somebody does try to sneak through and uh, in the middle of the night <clears throat> got up to somewhere in regional Victoria, lived in the uh, fields and decided to go for a, uh, a sandwich at a restaurant. They now have to produce their ID or the shopkeepers can get fined $10,000. So that's the um, nice free uh, part of uh, Australia I live in. So, yeah, All I very strange say time. <laughs> thank god for racing and all these yeah. people say oh you know what why do you have such an interest in racing because times like this i've got something to do oh, i think it's a i think it's a miracle that racing has survived that's all yeah. i know and i think extra well you all moan and groan about certain things to do with the authorities or whatever else but you've got to give full credit to all the racing administrators and those in the racing world that we have not had a closure of racing. I think we've had the odd half day here or there where there's been yeah. a slight scare. But seriously, it is amazing that racing has done so well. Yeah. And uh, look, even full credit as well to the AFL, which you know, in, in, in Victoria, if you're a Victorian or you've ever lived here, you realise that's sort of our, almost like our religion, as some people will say. They did very well to get out, get to the bubbles. And you know, thank you to Queensland as well to allow that to happen where they could go. And they didn't do too badly, our footballers and those privileged ones who were connected with AFL clubs because they did let them in. Yep. Whereas, you know, I've got a property in uh, Queensland uh, on the Gold Coast, but I'm not allowed to go there. By the way, I still pay my rates and taxes and whatever I've got to pay, but I'm not allowed to go, right? So you're not even allowed to quarantine in Queensland. So it's, it's very strange that um, yeah, as an Australian paying taxes and everything as we do, that we sort of like for the first time, blocked from being able to go either state or go anywhere so you know <clears throat> very strange times but hopefully it's over shortly and uh, we can resume but we are in exciting racing times so let's get into what's going on in the world of racing all right so i'm going to talk a little bit about caulfield and that on the weekend yep we've got some stuff to talk about in sydney yep i mean i actually have one of my best bets in sydney on saturday <laughs> Um, Montefilia. I yep. really thought that was quite a special. And as you said to me, the Friday night market pointed that you had to take it early because the way the money was coming, if you weren't in it, you were going to miss the price. Absolutely. Look, I priced that. Uh, I priced Montefilia on uh, Saturday at uh, $1.75. I got on Friday night at $3.60. Uh, and, you know, it was one of those ones you had to get on early because I knew it had trade. Under three dollars, which yeah, it did, yeah. and then I think it came into about two sixty in the end. But yeah, it was a good bet, drawn perfectly, and it was a class horse of the field. Yeah, I agree with you there. The one thing with Montefilia, I just love the way it grinds. It just, <coughs> just yeah, you know, 
it's an out and out stayer. Oh, and absolutely. It's still young, and I just think, you know, next year or the year after, it's going to be an absolute star. Yeah, I think it's a, a very good uh, horse. I'm just looking at my ratings now. Yeah, I priced it at $1.75. The other thing with Montefilia is that uh, Collett is riding in fantastic form too. Yes. Yeah. And I think that was a, a big plus. I mean, you know, we talk about we have a lot of great jockeys in, in Australia at, at, and at certain times. And one of the things I look with jockeys is the last 90 days or where they're at. And for Collett, he's on the up. And this is the time where jockeys really can make their entire year because if you have a great spring carnival coming into this carnival, people remember and you'll keep getting the rides in December, January or whatever. And he has the intent and he's been riding very well. So I think he's riding as any as good as any jockey in Australia. And the good thing is I think that he's being a little bit underpriced. Yeah. Whereas yep. a lot of jockeys, we all, you know, the Huey Bowmans and all those great jockeys, but Sometimes you're losing the odds because they're on it, whereas I think Collett's equally as good at the moment as any jockey in Australia. Yep, I agree with you there. I agree 100%. I mean, the one thing is um, the thing that Michael Walker, that they put Craig Williams on on Saturday. Hold on, mate. I'll just bring it up. I've got it over here. I'm pretty sure I've got it over here. Um, is that the one? Where are we? So not Mr. Quickie's right. Tagaloa. Yep. I really think they made a mistake taking Michael Walker off at so close to the big one. Yeah, well, I, I thought I backed Tagaloa and uh, Ole Kirk in that race because I've given no. Ole out before uh, on uh, your um, <coughs> particular uh, Zoom calls we have on a Tuesday night. I, I picked it uh, a few starts ago as a, as a horse to follow. Well, yeah, I put and that I backed up. it, but I, yeah. Yeah, I put yeah. it in the black book as your black book. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, and, 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 and I, I backed it on Saturday, but I did think Tagaloa. And I backed yeah. Tagaloa early at 5.50, and that came in. The money was on Tagaloa, but I backed them both. But, uh, gee, it it, yeah. um, it was up there, but, gee, it stopped like it was uh, – I'm not yeah, sure what happened at the end of it. I've, I've looked at Stewart's report. They couldn't find anything wrong with it. No, it was a very, very strange uh, run. I'm just going to look up now. How far was it actually uh, – it actually ran officially last. Something must have gone wrong. It, it's got beaten 19.5 lengths. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And All right, I'm just looking the up race. Yeah. 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 And, and the difference is, I think Michael Walker is one of the best riders at Caulfield. He understands yep. the track. If you go and look at the ride that he did on Odium in the yep. race, you know, in the film. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep, yeah. yep, yep, yep. Right? If you watch the way he rode it, I actually think that is a very special horse because... It, he had to ride it up two or three times during the race to keep his position, and he, yep. he would ride it up, get the position again, and then switch it off. Ride it yep. up, switch it off. And that's a sign of a horse that understands what's going on in racing. So it was really yep. well-educated, and at the end of the race, nothing was going to beat it. Well, Saturday it appeared to me he wanted to be not on the lead but just behind the lead on uh, at Caulfield. Yep. He settled at third. And like you say, he was third on the turn. But I think the magic of that horse, Odium, which is, uh, you know, I wasn't on it on Saturday, but I tell you what, I actually left the race alone because I, I hungry heart coming out of Sydney, which I, I do a lot more, but I thought it was a little bit underpriced and I wasn't that uh, confident on it on Saturday. But Odium, it had the magic, I reckon, of the trainer of the moment as well, uh, is Mick Price and Michael Kent. But especially, you know, over the years, Michael, you know, Mick Price, I think, has been one of the best trainers for so many years, back in the old days when trainers used to set them up for plungers, whatever else, yep. coming off yep. track work or that, this guy was absolutely a magic back in the days when we used to go to the track and chart and you'd see a first starter or something. If it was Mick Price and the money was on, you always respect it. But this guy, he's a fantastic trainer. And the one thing about Mick Price is he just knows how to get them fit. I think the other magic of a Mick Price as a trainer, and now he's with Mick, my, Michael Kent Jr., he's doing very well, is he knows how to place him. And the one thing I've learned with all these trainers and all the rest, and Waller, another one as well, they know how to place their horses right. Yes, I, I right. agree with you 100%. And, and I think that's the same yeah. as Mick Kent's dad. Yeah, I yeah. Mean, he's a great trainer. Yep, absolutely. You I know? was going to say, I think the sons learn a lot off the father, right? Oh, so, definitely. definitely. Yeah, yeah. And that's what, why he's, he would be working with, um, working with that stable because – he fits in that in that echelon of you know well well trained well brought up 
And this having two trainers doing it, it must ease the workload a huge amount. Well, I think I think it is. I think it's a bit like even in the bookie world now, where you can have people as corporates or, or getting together in, in partnerships and all that. It makes sense. Uh, Waterhouse bot, and I mean, in, in some t- cases, it's a bit like in business of that. You have the the older, experienced player, and they're probably not wanting to work eighty hours a week. Which, if you're a young trainer these days, and especially in the city, you're working incredible hours with staff and all that. So they have the younger one coming in, but they have the experienced person like a uh, Mick Price who just has that incredible experience of knowing where to place and whatever else. Plus also he has the trust of the owners who will be giving them the better horses. Yeah. 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 I mean, there's, there's one thing I know if people have had, uh, I've heard before if people have had horses with Mick Price, he's very honest to tell them when the horse is good or if maybe it needs to go elsewhere to a different jurisdiction. And right? that's, so, and which that's is very good. I think Michael Walker has a bit of a problem with this because he's so upfront with people about their horses, they don't like, owners don't like when someone says your horse is a hack. Well, that's right. And I mean, look, uh, the one thing, again, having a lot of friends who've got horses with uh, a lot of different trainers, and, you know, over the years you get the ones send you their tapes of uh, what the trainers are going to do, and what you do is you get, as you're probably aware, you get this three-minute message of which one and a half minute will ta- minutes will tell you why it'll win, and one and a half minutes why it won't. Right? And yeah. Because they don't want to knock the horse, but they don't want to knock, you know, they, they don't want to say the it will definitely win, whatever else. So obviously a trainer's trying to keep the horses going and they've got whatever else. But at the end of the day, the, the tape doesn't mean a lot. From what I've heard of people around the Mick Price uh, type, uh, he's very honest. And if I had a horse with someone, I'd rather him be honest with me instead of just, you know, keeping my, my spirits up or whatever else. And uh, I think that's that, that also gets back to, like we said, uh, you know, having the nous of knowing how to place the horse properly. Yeah. Uh, is a big advantage. And, you know, he gets them fit. And when they're going, boy. And at this time of the year, I think he said horses months up to know that they're going to be the right ones coming through. Yep, and yep. for those who are following the stable, they're obviously getting very good value as well. Yep, exactly. It's, it's, it's like um, that race six on Saturday with Russian Camelot. That was yep. another one. I think the horse is still a year short. Well, I actually, yeah, uh, I, I was going to talk about, I'm happy to say now that, um, and in my horses to follow, I actually am more confident of Russian Camelot now, or equally as confident to win the Cox Plate as I was before. Yeah. I, I really think, like it. I don't think he's a two-miler or anything like that. No, 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 no. He's not a two-miler. I think, I think, I think, he's, he, I think he's, yeah. he's just a brilliant racer. And it's the same as, yeah, like, sure, Aura the Garda didn't run the distance on Saturday, but they don't want to win a $300,000 $300, race. They want to win a $4 million race. So over the years, I've learned one thing on, on uh, being a Victorian and, and, and going to uh, Caulfield for many years and the week before the Caulfield Cup. How many years in a row, I'd love to know the stat, I actually don't have it in front of me, but how many times the favourite of the week before which is going into a Caulfield Cup of that, doesn't win. It has a good run, just doesn't get the right things. We're not going to say anything wrong with it. But like you said, one of the things I look for is what is the grand final? Yes. Not what is the, not what is the one where you're, where you're a qualifier, but you're already definitely in the grand final. Yeah. And that's one of the things I look at with a lot of the group racing in that is what is, what is, the, what is the, the race they're being set for? Right? Yeah. Do they want to thrash their guts out? I'm not saying they're not trying, but they don't necessarily want to do everything and not get there to the grand final. Yep. It's I think that, as... uh, yeah, a bit like Alligator Blood on Saturday as well. You know, another one I think that uh, when it gets to its grand final, which I think is going to be the Golden Eagle of that, I think it'll do well. But, yep. uh, you know, it's like the run before in Brisbane. You know, it was it was a very good barrier troll. It was, wasn't was saying it wasn't going, but let's just say got bit, came home very nicely on Saturday. I didn't think it was should be as short as it was. I thought it was more of a three dollar shot than it was a odds on shot. So I wasn't surprised to uh, see it uh, drift a bit. Know a few smarties that actually had said to me they they were going to be laying it um, because they thought it again it was probably a run short and it wasn't really set for that distance as well. So again, I think that um, you know you've got to be aware that uh, while they're very good horses, you've got to work out in doing your form and all the rest and, and understanding the circuit what races are they set for and they can't all be a winks it's that, very that, rare to have a horse who's going to win every time yep yep because in that that herbert power that last race on saturday yep that was a brilliant run by Shapata. 
Oh, and, yeah, I actually backed your Two I other good runs yeah. in the race. One yep. was just a track gallop, and that was the chosen one because that yep. stable will set them just for the one one race. And the yep. other one that ran really well with that Damien Lane. And Damien Lane, when it comes to this time of the year, he steps up. And he's won a few races in the last you know, week or so. But he was on Gaelic Chieftain. That was a pretty... That's right. Yeah, I've got... Yep, 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 yep. Yep. That was a pretty impressive run down there. He was only beaten 1.63 lengths, you know, uh, Gaelic Chieftain. That's exactly yes. right. Yeah. But, you know, Chapada, uh, yeah, I, look, I thought that was a beautiful... Uh, Daniel Stackhouse and all that was a, it was a very good ride. But then Michael Maroney's another one. This is when he comes to his forefront. Now, and, and, and even the country cups or whatever else, Yep. There's certain trainers that year after year, they specialise in stayers. And there's no doubt stayers are a different uh, type of horse to the... We, we've all become sprint fanatics. And a lot of these young three-year-olds and all that, they'll never get to be a stayer because they come in and obviously they're going for breeding purposes or whatever else. They Unfortunately, we don't ever get to see who may be a great stayer. But Michael Maroney's and those, they have horses who are going to be stayers. And yes, that was, a, that was Chapada is one of those. Yeah, well, it, it was like the Cranbourne Cup on Sunday. I had yep. Odin as my top rater in that race. Yep. I The only thing that was against me drew 17. That was the only thing. And I thought, he is going to get caught wide. And whether he can get a position, I'm not sure. And and he was still fighting on to get second in the end of the race. I yep. think if he'd drawn an alley, he would have just about won that. So I didn't, I didn't bet in the race. The only one I would have was Odin. And the reason I didn't is... I liked the price, but the, the barrier put me off. And I looked yeah. at the rest and I, and I thought, yeah. didn't spend a lot of time in it, but I, I thought, you know, this is going to be a very difficult race. But I agree. If Odin had been drawn barrier five, six, seven, I was on it. Paid, paid uh, four, four yeah. the place. Yeah, I know. I know. Yeah, look, it ran second. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I spoke to someone else I know who does Melbourne form uh, and gave him a call about it. And um, he said exactly the same, barrier, right? But that again, it was the only thing. That was it was a, the only thing. But I, look, I agree. If I, uh, it was certainly if you're throwing it in exotics or you're doing it, it was very good price. Yeah, 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 definitely. Now, what another good run on the weekend was that Mister Quickie. Yeah. Always, as soon as he hits form like this, he'll win a couple in a row. But God, didn't he win with authority in that race? Yeah, look, he won by 2.13 uh, lengths. And again, there's another tra- look, great combination. Philip Stokes, excellent trainer, coming across from Adelaide. And I tell you, another one who I think is a great jockey, one of the best female, there's some very good female jockeys, Jamie Carr. Yeah, well, I put her up as a black booker to follow. About yeah, no, no. Ago. She was so good. When she was doing the Adelaide circuit there, and that's where she obviously got her, uh, her stripes from, she's an absolute ripper. Yeah. She... I have no problem with Jamie Carr on any horse. They, they travel so nicely for her. Well, I think she gets back to my, and I've spoken about it before. I think there's a lot of horses like the way a female jockey treats them, yep. a bit kinder, uh, and they just know how to get the best out of them. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. That, so, you know, quite frankly, as, as I've often said to a lot of people, um, I very rarely ever find a reason to complain about re- horses ridden by female jockeys in, in the New South Wales circuit, Matt, there's a lot of very good underrated female jockeys going around in the outer New South Wales circuit, and they're very good. And I think it's because they have an affinity with the horse, well, the, the, which I think has an advantage. I, I think there were three rides on Saturday that, for me, were not questionable, but I really like Dirty Works in Race 5 and the Scalacci, yeah. but I think Diamond Effort, I mean, that horse steps up every time it races and it had to draw everything into the race from three wide. And that, and I thought that was a great run. The question, the one I question is the he way... He went, actually, diamond effort, you're saying it. He was five wide, no cover at the 1,000. Yep. And like you said, he was three wide, no cover at the 800 and the 600. Yep. Right? So, like, he's covered lengths extra. Exactly. And he only got run down in the last... By point one two. So, he actually... Yep. If you look at the run of the look, although dirty work did go wide as well. Yep, yep. Dirty work was wide, but they were both excellent runs. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. But dirty work, I mean, he'd won five <laughs> out of or something at, yep. that, at that time of his preparation, every start he's had. Yeah, I believe he's going to the Everest, I think. Yes, I think yeah. so. The I other think it could th- be the last slot, yeah. Yep. So the other two, I think, 
is uh, instant celebrity. I didn't think that was a good ride by Craig Williams. Right. I think he just he he was just a bit too cool on him, and and Michael Walker stole the race on the home turn. You know, by the time he had skipped, he 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 got everything off the bat, and he was yep. never going to yep. get run down. <clears throat> you know, so that for me, I mean, I don't knock Craig Williams at all. I just think he, no. you know, I just think he he completely different race <clears throat> when you're running in a in a race like a Group One like that. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, and that was the first time that horse had been beaten. Um, the ride in Ollie Kirk's race, uh, Ashar, that Damien rode for, rode for um, Hazy, that was another good run. That that horse there was, yeah. Ollie Kirk beat him because he was race fit. I think absolutely. Ashar was uh, three wide the whole way. Sorry, it was three wide the whole way. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you look at Ollie Kirk, was two wide to the 600 metres, and then he went into the rails, whereas yeah. Asia was three wide the whole way to yeah. the 400, right? Yeah. So you can't, you're you looking at covering an extra couple of lengths. Yeah, exactly. Right. And so, yeah. Say, oh, it's only a couple of lengths, but that couple of lengths can be like... He got beaten 0.38. That's the difference. That can be the difference, as you know. Yep, yeah. yeah. the, the extra distance. Now, in Mr. Quickie's race, you know, I still think that was still a big run by Buffalo River, first time in a Group One. I, you know, to lead all the way and try and kick on the home turn, and yep. to think you can sprint it for four hundred metres after leading all the way. I think the six <coughs> was a little bit fast at some stages, weren't they? Uh, yeah, they were in that race. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. No, it, it, it was pretty even. It was a it was a pretty well run race. Yes, it was above it was above average uh, sectionals in that race. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It was yeah. a well run. Then, both both the, the the first sectionals and the last sectionals were above par. So it was a very. On what I look for for horses going to become good good form races, that certainly is one. Yes. Yeah. And I and I yeah you know, for me you know I got Ashar. I I really like that. Um, what's the other one that I I I tell you what I think the Russian Camelot race that was a good run by um, Galio Chop. Galio Chop, yep. I think if they took it and put it in the Emirates on the last day, he'd just about lead all the way. Yeah, no, no, look, it, it, absolutely. And look, uh, the winner, Acadia Queen, was another very good run. But, I mean, last start, yeah. uh, Acadia Queen went down the inside of the track when Pike yeah. went down the inside, but clearly it was, it was definitely favouring where Russian Camelot went. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. 12 months ago... Uh, one of the best judges I know in racing and uh, a fairly uh, fu- guy, I won't give his name out, but he's well-known in the racing world, said Acadia Pre- Queen was about the best horse in Australia at that time. I think It's back. It's back. It's, 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 it's back to where it was. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I, don't think, I think that, as I said, I still believe Russian Camelot, but I won't know till I do the form on the day. But I think that uh, it's back, though. Because <clears throat> Russian Camelot's a three-year-old, isn't it? Yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah, so that, yeah. I mean, the Cox Plate suits it to a T. No, uh, no, Russian Camelot's a four-year-old. Four-year-old. Oh, yeah, four-year-old. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, but, yeah. They, and um, Arcadia Queen's a five-year-old mare, yeah. Yeah. But when the, once mares hit form, they hold form. Oh, no, I agree. I agree. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah they, they're very good at holding form very well. So, you but, know, yeah. I've, I'll, I'll do up my black bookers later, but, you know, I thought Diamond Effort was a good run. Ashar was a good run. I think Shapata was, you know, a lead up for the Caulfield Cup. If he's not in the finish, I'll be surprised. Yep. And I think he needed to win that on Saturday to make sure he was definitely in it. Absolutely. Yeah. No. Look. Uh, and as, look, I'll, I'll I'll go through now my black bookers if you like for uh, yep. which I've gone through for Sydney. <clears throat> my one was uh, one of mine is actually a winner on Saturday. Amy Shadow. It was an excellent run over sixteen hundred meters from race one. Yep. It's won four of his, she's won four of her last six. The best thing about Amy Shadow, it's won from heavy to good, and eleven hundred to sixteen hundred. But it's in form. Yep. And like you said, you know, um, mares and that they can keep going. This horse is was an excellent run on Saturday, <clears throat> and I think it's still got a run or two left in it to uh, to win. Yeah. Uh, the other one I liked on Saturday was in race six. Dawn Passage. Look, it, it was first up Yep. on Saturday. Last prep, it won start three, four, and five up, right? 
and two of them were group threes. 1,400 metres ideal. Saturday it got a bit far back. It was first up. Dawn Passage doesn't have to necessarily lead, but it needs to be near the lead. And on Saturday it's act seventh. Right? I think uh, next start or the start after, I'll be certainly on it. I've black booked it. So Dawn Passage I do like. And the other one that was an excellent run on Saturday, this is at um, clearly for me was Lions Raw in race seven. Okay. It settled fourth. It was uh, second. And on the turn, it held on and was just beaten by Montefilia by 0.75 of a length. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah. the pace was very fast for the 800 metres uh, by Street Dancer, who faded. But Lions were all hung on. It was a very good run. And if you think about the fact that Montefilia is, uh, you know, is A class, Lions Raw is one of those horses that uh, can go on and can run, can win a, a good race or two at fair odds. So I wouldn't look, let that get away uh, from you. Uh, now, a horse that I did back and had a very good result on on Saturday. Now, I got it on form by my ratings, but also um, because of its trial. It's called Ramstein. It's a Gerald Ryan and Alexu uh, trained horse. Another great partnership going through because yeah. Gerald Ryan's got uh, a lot of experience. This horse won Kembla first up class one on Saturday at 1,200 metres. It had 246 days off and it had two trials. But the thing is, Two of the, it was second to Guy Trash at its trial. On that trial on the 28th of the 9th at Rose Hill, it's produced three winners, right? And, of course, it was against the Group 1 winner. I think it's got a lot of upside for the next two starts, and I'll be following it in anything from a Class 2 to a, six, a benchmark 64, um, you know, and, and ideally around that uh, 1,200 to 1,400 metres, I think it's got a lot of upside. That, another one of another one I do like uh, from the same day of trials, which um, hasn't had a run yet. Uh, something I look at is a lot of trials, not only looking at them, but uh, from watching the, watching them, but also looking at the sectionals and everything else. Is ready to roar. It's another Gerald Ryan and Alexu horse. Now this horse trialed excellently, and it's ready to win a maiden. It's a three-year-old, but uh, certainly I've black booked that. Ready to roar. Yep. What distance, mate? Uh, well, it's going to be a first starter. It's, it's probably going to be, you're looking at probably up to about 1,200 metres, 1,000 to 1,200. Why don't you um, write these down, send them, and I'll put them in the black bookers. Yeah, I will. I'll send them through to yeah. you. The other Another one of your black bookers, mate, you had two winners out of the two. You only had two yeah. black bookers in there on Saturday. Yeah. Talk about your other one. Dude, that was a good price, mate, on Saturday. She's that ideal. Was... Yeah, no, she's yeah. ideal was another one I gave at the last show. And certainly, <clears throat> yeah, look, you could well, have I, had a, I rated it at, uh, I think, 556 to 1. Yep, yep. No, look, it was it was a good price. And uh, that's another horse that uh, I'd picked up the start before. And as I said, it, it's a lot of upsides. So another horse I've got, it's a maiden, but uh, I reckon it could be good uh, for even um, Metro, is a horse called Osei. It's a three-year-old trained by Hawks. Uh, I'm going to back it first up. 1,100 metres to 1,300 metres. Now, I do all right with some of these that are maidens or haven't had a really – they're not known, and yeah. I look at them through trials, and I black book them because that's why you can get on. And if you look at it early, get on at 9 o'clock, but just beforehand you can get good odds, um, which is a big advantage. I've got another another great trainer, and this is a guy I follow, and it was trained, running a barrier trial um, ridden by Josh Collett, uh, by uh, Jay Collett. Matthew Dunn trained horse called Rainbow Connection. It's not had a start, but it was first up in a trial, and I'm going to be definitely backing that at its first two starts. I will send you these. And the other one I had, which we did speak about earlier, uh, I'm definitely going to be black on is Russian Camelot. I didn't think it, it didn't lose anything from me. It's a very classy horse, and um, I think it'll go well on the Cox Plate. Okay, Cox Plate. So what I'll do is, you give me those ones, those unraced ones. Yes. And that. And I'll put I'll them send in. You, I'll, I'll send you all those. I'll put them into a chart, send them to you. Yeah. Now, next, next show, uh, what I'll be talking about next show, a couple of things from me. Here's a book I'm just reading through now, which is one I've read a couple of years ago. I'll be talking about Thoroughbred Cycles, which yep. is a US book, but it's very much about patterns and cycles of racing, not only from the, the form angles, but also trainers, jockeys. So I'm going to be talking about a few things from that particular book. Uh, the other area next show we'll be having is we're going to be interviewing uh, <clears throat> Jeff McMurray. Jeff uh, 
is a pedigree expert and breeding expert, has a fantastic database. And if there's any uh, thing I want to know about an unraced horse, two-year-olds, two-year-old stuff, he's really good at that. He's worked around the stables. He's extremely uh, connected. And more importantly, he, uh, look, he prices up what horses should go for at uh, all the uh, sales, whatever else. But that's his, his passion, his pedigrees, and understands all those angles, which is something that uh, I've never really understood any, at the level he does. Would you be able to get me maybe a photo or something yep. for this business? And we'll yeah, yeah, I'll look. For the yeah, guys no, I'll, so they I'll, know I'll, what to look forward to, what's coming on, and we'll start pushing it. Yeah, no problem at all. But, all yeah, right. Jeff will uh, will be interviewed by us and we can talk to him about what he looks for. And um, as I said, the one thing about Jeff is that over the years, he's given me some very good – what he does by the, the pedigrees is not only off the trials, but before they run, he's really good at understanding what they're – you know, through their bloodlines and that, who's the who's a triple-A pedigree, double-A pedigree. And in some of those big uh, Magic Millions and all that, this year's Magic Millions – uh, he had the long price winner as his top pick, right? So he is known by a few in the right circles in uh, in racing, and he's very good at that. So he will be interviewed by us to talk about form in a different way than what you or I look for, which is what we're trying to do. Yeah. Is you know the one thing about racing is, while I'm more about doing uh, my ratings one particular way, you do yours a bit similar but in a different way. There's many different ways of looking at racing, and that's the great thing. You can get five or six people who actually make profits and do well out of racing but we all do it slightly differently. Yeah. So it's one of the, what, what I'm hoping that this show can bring is many different angles that will hope, um, you know, educate and uh, encourage people to take and look at racing in a more in-depth and a different way. Yep, yeah, yep, yep. And the thing I want to do also is to give them links, websites and things like that yep. where they can go and find the, and the information, but also giving them the reasons why doing a little bit more work, you know, if, if you love it as a passion and you put yep. a little bit more time into it, it makes a huge difference to what you do. Absolutely. I mean, and you, you've managed your money. Like the last three weeks I've had on all my ratings, I've been within 50 cents or a dollar of the rated price. Now, the rated price is just a benchmark to work off. If the money's coming from the horse, you know it's going to affect the rated price, right? And then you have to decide, do I back in that race or I don't back in that race? You know, like on Saturday... Yeah, you know, I thought Montefilia on the Friday night was just a special. Yeah, yeah. Well, same. And, I, and, I and that's why, yeah, I agree. And, and, and I think one of the things I've learned is that by looking at, of course, you've got to try to look at when the, um, you know, the scratchings are what may affect the markets. But one of the things I have really looked at is if you, if you can get on late at night, the night before, and also um, if you can work out if, in that field, the horses that are very high in the market are not entered in another uh, meeting, then you'll know that you won't be getting, uh, you know, there's, the probability is there won't be too many scratchings or won't be much affected because that's also important as well. Well, I'll just, um, I've got something here. Because one, one of the things that annoys me, but I do, I do actually do a bit of extra homework, is if I'm doing a Monday meeting because the acceptances were done on a Thursday, the amount of horses that have actually run on the Saturday and Sunday, and probably one in 10 actually do run on the Monday meeting. But I don't know why, and I don't know why the authorities don't make them do it a bit earlier. It annoys me that they don't scratch them until 8 o'clock on the, on the morning of the race. And clearly, if a horse ran on a Saturday or Sunday, it's very unlikely to be going from Port Macquarie to Mwilambar to be running on a, a Monday. Well, I'll give you an example. Like when we talk about where the money goes and the things, and you want to get early markets and things like that, on Saturday, there were in the in just on the free stuff I put up with the money movers, in, in amongst the money movers I put up there were 20 winners, and that's not counting all of the place getters amongst them either. You know, I right. think there were 33 races, and in the 33 races, there were yep, there were 20 winners. And a few of them were at a reasonable price. So, you know, the money's there. You've just got to be able to balance where it is and look at the information people give you because, like with you and I, we're looking at this stuff all the time. Yeah, absolutely. And seven days a week, we're looking at things to do with racing. So absolutely. I do it because I want to help people make some freaking money. Yeah, yeah absolutely. The game that the bookmakers play. You know, like you, I mean, you had a phenomenal day on Saturday. 
Yeah, no, I, I certainly did have a good winning set. The other thing I want to let people know is please come in on our uh, the Tuesday. Uh, Tim hosts a fantastic uh, webinar, which is a very uh, – I've had one or two people I know that have gone in there. And as somebody said to me the other day, it was a good laugh, but there's also a bit of knowledge as well. And it's really a way for people to go in, ask questions, and talk about the previous Saturday's uh, meetings. But also, at the moment, with Group 1s and that on, uh, they've usually released who's going to be in the Group 1 on the Tuesday. And, yep. you know, while we may not have done the form, we do talk about some of those horses as well we're looking at and what's coming in. And, uh, you know, like uh, the ones that are on like this week, I'll be talking about some of the horses I'm looking at for um, Caulfield tomorrow, as well as Warwick Farm, because I'm doing a few races. There's some good races there tomorrow as well. The Caulfield yeah, meeting I'll, tomorrow. I'll be, yeah, I'll be yeah. doing the same as well. Um, the, I need to change the time to 7 o'clock. Uh, yep. Queensland time, but I've made the mistake of not asking Michelle. So this week I still have to do it at the same time, mate. But next okay. week we'll change it, bring it back so it suits everybody. But we'll um, we'll put the link in for the horses there as well because I want to yep. put a link in this here at the bottom of it about the money movers so they can actually see what's in the money movers and I'll give them what I give the members and I'll show them what I give the because on the members one for the pro section I up. I do an update on the money movers at about one o'clock. Yep. Okay. Yeah. So I put the first one up at 11 o'clock. I put one up on Friday night at 10 o'clock. And then I put another one up at just after lunch on the Saturday. So they can actually see what's happening within the money market. All right. So in Melbourne, every single race had the place getters, but there were one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight of the races had the winner. Excellent. Excellent. So, all right. So, what I'll do is um, I'll see you tonight, mate. Yep. No worries. Have a good day on the punt. I'll talk to you soon. See ya. Bye. See you, mate.